Previously on the adult show. Uh, Andy Steiger, fantastic. Yeah, shout out to them. Actually, that guy's so ripped. He's he's ripped. He's so strong. Yeah, he's so he's, strong. He's humble yeah. about it. He's yeah. very humble about it. I'd say this to his face. He humble brags about it. Does, oh, he? does he? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, the tight shirts. Oh yeah. yeah, like you know, the guy. He can. He can. He can pull it off and wear. Yeah, he can. He's a good-looking guy. Yeah, he is. Shout out Andy if you're watching. Yeah, shout out. It's the eye of the tiger, and their future is bright, evolving every day to overtake their rivals. They are innovating and evolving all night. They will capture the world with the eye of the tiger. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the in Doubt Show. Uh, listen, we got a fantastic program today. Lots of awesome things to be talking about, important things to be talking about, which is every week, let's be honest. But uh, before we dive into the conversation, we want to just uh, get you to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, that may, that gets us in touch where you're getting all the updated information of reels and videos that we post throughout the week. Uh, I think that would be fantastic. Also, if you're listening in Audio World, Spotify, Apple, leave a rating and a review especially if it's a good one. That would be fantastic. It would help us. Again, all that stuff helps with the algorithms. And we want to hear from you. So if you're watching on YouTube right now, just comment below just right now in this moment. Go to the little like thing where you can actually write comments and just let us know um, what are some things you appreciate? What are some things you'd like to see change? If there's specific topics that you'd really like us to address and bring up in conversations, we'd love to hear from you. We want to make sure we're resourcing you with things that are helping you navigate in today's world. And so please leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you so that we're making sure we're hitting topics that are important to you. I also want to let you know, Apologetics Conference is coming. Uh, March 1st and 2nd at Northview Church in Abbotsford. We're going to be doing the In Doubt show live with Dr. John Newfeld, which I'm very, very excited about. You can go to indoubt.ca. You can get your tickets, and we would love to see you there for the live taping. I think it's going to be fantastic. And then we don't have to keep using the fake audio applause. That's true. It would be real applause, real human beings. Speaking of real human beings, Chris. Hello. You're in the room. How I are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Life is good. Life is busy. Yeah. But uh, all is good. Um. We have a great conversation today. We're talking about we AI. Uh, you, did you? Meet more. Hi, losers. Why does it always smell like dirty socks in here? W well, I thought you were dead. The dark side of artificial intelligence is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. W what, are you, what are you even talking about? I am here to kick. Andy's butt. No, I told you, Vincent, you can't beat people up. We can't beat up our guests. I must prove my superiority over the man beast. Andy's tiger, with his perfectly shaped bald head, huge muscles under those incredibly tight shirts, he must be stopped. Okay, Vincent, we don't have time for this, okay? So you could sit there, but just don't beat anyone up and don't say anything. All right, so I'm moving on. This is a little bit ridiculous. So we have Andy Steiger in the house. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's great to be awesome. back yes. here. Yes. Thank you, studio, our live studio. Yes. We we're big fans of you here on the program. And Appreciate those screams. You know, they're passionate here. <laughs> they're passionate, those people here. Um, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you know, the lots of cool things you're doing, even for conference coming up. So we have conference March 1st and 2nd, yeah. which is coming up real soon. Yeah, we have the Apologetics Canada Conference yep. happening here in Abbotsford at yep. Northview Community Church. Would love for people to come. It's going to be yes. a great time. Where can they get their tickets? Tell them right now. I know you're watching right now. Yes, you can get your tickets at apologeticscanada.com. Yep. And the theme this year is Can I Trust the Bible? Where we're going to be talking on various topics about the Bible, from how did we get it to can I trust it? And even is it good? Hmm. And as you know, uh, in June, we were in Egypt actually filming yep. for this this series that will be used at at our conference. And so people get a get a little taste of that series and they'll get access to it. It's going to be awesome. Are you allowed to tell a little sneak peek of that whole language thing or is that going to be a surprise? That's going to be a surprise. Okay. It's okay. Going to be a surprise, but... <laughs> wow. But he did not mean to press that. But that being said, perfect segue. You, you know what? I can actually, I can actually talk about that though because... <laughs> talk about that sound? Well, or... you know what? Yeah, because I heard the goat, I'm fine. I'm going to talk about it. Do it. 
<laughs> but <laughs> thanks, Chris. <laughs> yeah, you know, because this actually segues at some level into what we're going to talk about today with regards to AI. Yeah, and we're because we're using AI as a part of the Can I Trust the Bible project. Yeah, where we're going to be premiering at the conference the ability to show this series in three languages. We'll we'll be showing the trailer in Romanian, in French Canadian, and in Hindi. And so one of the things that's kind of crazy with this though is it's actually my voice and Wes who we we did this project. It's our voice speaking those languages which actually matches our lips. That's crazy. Crazy. Took the AI four hours of analyzing our voice and then it could spit out any language we wanted. Wow, in your voice. In your voice. So, I mean, AI is like growing and adapting. We've seen, obviously, with Vincent coming back. We don't even know how he got here, but he's you here. You are so weak. Who, you talking? Is he talking to me? No, I think he's... I am so happy. Andy is skipping leg day to be here with us. Wow. Dude. Is that this guy? He just made fun of your... His, this Christmas box over here? I am so much stronger than you. Okay. That's <laughs> not true. <laughs> He doesn't even know. It's pretty vicious, man. So AI could actually turn against us in a sense. Well, I guess that's the challenge, right? Technology can be used for good or, or for, for evil. Yeah. Let's do a push-up contest. First to 2,000 wins. First to two. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure about 1,000, but I think I could How take him. How many could you actually? I think, I think I could take him. I think you could yeah. take him. He's Look at his little chicken arms there, little... Yeah, if you call those arms. So. Yeah. Oof. Oh, <laughs> man. Hey, Mr. Clean, don't you have a bathroom to sanitize? <laughs> Wait, just can you give me a second? You, you do you, yeah. man. You do what you need to do. I, I feel like mm. this guy's being a little disrespectful here. we, we got to get... Andy, oh, no. Uh <clears throat> wow. I don't think... Uh, <sighs> I, I mean, I know he's strong, but I didn't expect that strength. Yeah, no kidding, right? Yeah. So yeah, sorry, sorry you had to see that. That that's uh, a society you have never seen before, actually. Well, he kind of like the guitar is moving from the from just the punch. He he the wind hit a from nerve. the punch. Yeah, hit a nerve there, man. Well, my five year old made that, so I do feel a little bit bad about that. But uh, it was that was that was that was intense. Uh, yeah. We probably should have a human third. Share guests. I think that might be a little bit better instead yeah. of this AI stuff. And then we'll talk through AI. So uh, those in audio world, if you're listening and you hear this music, uh, you know him. It's kind of like his WWE <laughs> like uh, wrestling song. Yeah, you can just got to clean up the clean up the mess. Yeah. All right, we got Marcus Miller in the house. How's it going? I'm back. Okay. How are you? Oh no, another AI. This is terrible. <laughs> Terminator. <laughs> Happy to be here. Yeah, happy to have a human yeah. here. I know, uh, I, you know, I'm glad he finally, hopefully once and for all, Vincent is... I won't attack you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and so, sorry about the carnage over there. Got a little Oh, no, it's, it's all good. All yeah. good. We just have to say sorry to my son, really, if you're watching. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Yeah, sorry. But it, it needed to be done. It needed to be done. So this is a very important topic. And I know you did a topic on this recently at Northview. And it was just packed house. Yeah, I've been speaking on this actually. Uh, quite a all, bit. Yeah, quite yeah. a bit. Because as you know, my PhD work is in the area of what it means to be human. And a significant portion of my study was in AI. Which, yeah, huge. So uh, like, yeah, so for example, like just this last year alone, um, was out in Texas with John Lennox uh, speaking on the subject of, cool. of AI. And yeah. then, uh, and then in fact, John Lennox and I did uh, a couple others as well in Canada. Cool. And so... Yeah, it was cool. And it was actually actually great to be with John Lennox. I mean, it could very well be his last time in North America. I mean, he's getting mm, yeah. he's getting up there in years. Yeah, yeah. what a privilege and an honor. Um, I want to go through a, a breaking news uh, little segment, if that's okay. Can we do a little breaking news? Because something just yeah. happened, and I'd like to just discuss it a little bit. So right now we have breaking news. Okay, so the first human patient received an implant from Elon Musk's company, this brain interface company called Neuralink. Yeah. Um, and I know they've been doing a lot of testing. And they've, I don't know if you've seen some of the tests where they were doing it on the monkey and the monkey was like texting, I want a snack with like the screen. Have you seen that? No. <laughs> so no. the monkey had a Neuralink chip in his head. And he's texting. And he, he uses his brain to text the letters, I want a snack. 
Okay. That's, so monkeys are to new to and me. texted quite a bit faster than me, to be honest. I was a little bit wow. overwhelmed. But no, it wasn't faster. I'm just joking. But anyways, on Monday, a few weeks ago, uh, the platform informed the first patient has received a plant in his head. So what does this mean? What is Neuralink? Uh, it spikes... Uh, it uh, spikes the all the neuron detections, all the things in your brain. So you'll be able to, uh, people who are blind will be able to see, people who are lame will be able to walk. And even the way he talks about it, he says, you know, the blind will see and the lame will walk. It kind of sounds a little similar, but... Yes, uh, Jesus-esque for sure. Very much so. Well, because that's a good point. Even Google will talk about that the dead will be you know, raised to the cloud sort of idea that you can even have eternal life through technology. Yeah. And they're, and they're trying to make it so that you'll basically never die. Right. Yeah. So very, which we, very we, Which we got to talk about. This is yeah. good things that, yeah. Because we're going to be seeing this more and more in the news. Um, how do we respond when people are trying to push this agenda of you can never die or, you know, all these literal healings and miracles yeah. in the eyes of the world. Well, let me, let's back up just a little bit too, because there's kind of two conversations taking place parallel yeah. uh, as we've been getting into this already. One is you've got AI technologies that are happening, but then you've also got these AI technologies that are being integrated with humans. So right. mm. these, these are kind of two different things that are going on. And it's not just that the lame l might walk or the blind see, but maybe the blind see even better or right. the lame walk even better. Yeah. And so this tends to fall under the category of human enhancement, mm -hmm. which I think makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable. Like, yeah. should you be enhancing a human? And then the big question is, how far is too far? Mm. And so I think the neural link's a big one because I think a lot of people are are kind of like, I don't know, is it is it too far? Yeah. But let me, let me throw something at you, okay? Yeah, yeah. Tell me like tell me how you guys would respond to this. Can you even imagine a human without technology? What would that even look like? Well, it's all around us all the time, but if we just go back to when there wasn't a lot of technology and try to envision what it would be like? Yeah, like I mean, you're wearing clothes right now, you have shoes on, so I'd be naked. So, okay. So first of all, you'd be naked. We're going to, you know, Genesis 2. <laughs> right? Now all of a sudden we're going like seriously back yeah. to Genesis. And now, you know, you don't, you got no tools. So I guess you're naked in a garden eating fruit, I guess. But my, my point being, it seems as though God at some level has baked technology into this whole equation. Like, right. um, like have people always been meant to be a part of technology? Hmm. Well, and computers are a further like extension of technology but technology is really human advancement in creating things right yeah a computer's a tool it's a tool that people create ai is a tool that humans have created and we yeah. and we can use it for good or evil and this is the reality and a lot of people are like feeling uncomfortable with neuralink or all these things that are happening when it kind of blends with like you know human existence but people were always afraid or laughing or uncomfortable with telephones Cell phones, computers, mm -hmm. internet. Or and try they, or try this one on. You're wearing glasses right now. Yeah. That's a an enhancement of some kind. Uh, especially if you had binoculars. Yeah. But then other people have contact lenses, other people get laser eye surgery. And now there's the idea, well, we can pop the hood on the he human genome and fiddle with things. And so it's kind of this weird, you know, frog in the kettle moment technologically where we're like, we're okay with technology, clearly, but we're just not sure how Far we go. Okay, right. so going back to the glasses then. Okay, I have these glasses to enhance, you know, and like make my sight better. But now what about virtual reality glasses? And like all of a sudden now it starts to get a little bit, like, you know, Apple has their new, you were just talking to me about this the other day, their new. Right, yeah, the Apple Vision Pro, yeah. which like augmented reality and virtual reality Yeah. Um, that you're now seeing people like on the subway, there's that one clip of this guy that's just like moving his hands around. It looks ridiculous. Uh, and people were pointing out how silly he was looking, but everybody was like in the comments of it, were saying, well, everybody laughed when the, the iPhone was invented and mm. people glued to their phones. And once you actually experience it, then it's very quick how the pendulum swings mm -hmm. to people embracing those yeah. uh, technologies. I've been seeing more and more pictures of people that are being posted online of, yeah, somebody in a subway or uh, people in various, you know, 
capacities of life wearing these, wearing these goggles. And you're like, oh my goodness, is this the kind of world I want to live in? Yeah. But back to Neuralink though, I mean, I think it's important though that we realize like this isn't new. We've been here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had uh, implants for people to hear for a long time. Yeah. You know, or pacemakers. Yeah. Pacemaker. Like we're, I went, my point being the, the water is a lot hotter in the kettle, you know, the frog in the kettle. So we've been in the kettle for a lot longer than people think. Yeah, I, I mm-hmm. agree. It just looks different now and new technologies, you know, being used. Like pacemakers are so fantastic and a great... Anyone who's struggling with heart issues will want that. Yeah. Um, Here, if, here's the problem, by the way, that I see is that these are these are really new ideas. That So, for example, I, I've done a lot of work in the area of philosophy. Well, we can go back and we've got, you know, a millennia worth of Mm. thinkers to lean on as we've navigated various issues in society. Mm -hmm. When we're dealing with the issues we're dealing with today, these are like sci-fi level issues where, you know, Aquinas and Augustine weren't thinking about, you know, neural links and the like. We're dealing with theological challenges that we don't have a robust tradition to lean on. And that has made it, I think, a little bit more challenging for us to navigate how far is too far. Absolutely. And just for those who are listening who are like, I don't know what Neuralink is. I've never heard it before in my life. I'll just give you a quick little rundown what it says here in this. It says Neuralink aims to help people with paralysis communicate by allowing them to remotely control devices using brain activity. In the future, Neuralink may help enhance us uh, user memory and cognitive abilities, restore a user's motor, sensory, and visual functions, as well as treat neurological disorders. So think about that one. This is where, like, okay, enhance your, your memory. Well, we got things all around us, even I'm holding the Bible here, that enhance my memory. If I can't remember the whole Bible, well, I can write it down. And now I've got access to it sort of idea. Well, this is technology. This is a, an invention. Yeah. The book is an invention that yeah. we really cherish the and printing are thankful press. for. And the printing press. And by the way, that's an interesting point. Yeah. That when the printing press came, uh, we all of a sudden had to think about a world where everybody could have access to books. Hmm. Yeah. Right. And the theological challenges that came with that. Now, how do we wow. make sure people can read and how do we make sure they can hmm. interpret the Bible correctly? Yeah. And I think AI is going to be in a similar way. It's going to bring, it already is bringing new challenges. We got to think through, yeah. not to be afraid of, of course, Yeah. but to think about, okay, how, how, what's the biblical perspective of this? In many ways, that's what we're talking about right now. Yeah. And, and what would that be with, with Neuralink then being a, I guess, just another technology that's mm-hmm. been introduced? Yeah, this is something I've been thinking a lot about. And back to that idea, it's not, there's not a lot of great thinkers to lean on to, yeah. that, to can help us with this. So, you know, right now the, the Christian community is given a lot of thought to this. We would broadly put this in the area of what we call theological anthropology or what does it mean to be human? And then once we start, you know, diving deeper into that, begin to apply that in various areas, and Neuralink would be one of them. The quick answer would simply be that Jesus, we see in Jesus this argument, if you will, for what it means to be human. He he addresses this from the Jewish perspective of what's the greatest commandment, what's the most important thing to get right in this life. Mm. And his answer is to quote Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Leviticus 19. So the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he adds Leviticus 19, love your neighbors yourself. Mm -hmm. So ultimately he's saying the matrix by which we're navigating life is relationship. It's community. It's my relationship with God and my relationship with one another. And I would argue that as you and I navigate technology, we have to continually put it through that grid Mm. of relationship, of community. It's Neuralink adding to my relationship with God and, and people. Is it helping or is it hindering? And I think those are those are questions that we have to constantly ask, mm. even even of my phone. Yeah. Right. Like the, my phone can mm. be both. It could be. Yeah. It, it could enhance. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of great apps out there. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the Super Bowl. Uh, an app called Halo came out. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's an app for prayer. Yeah. That's great. Right. But it can also be something that distracts me from my wife, from my kids, yeah. from mm. from my Lord. Right. So it can help or it can hinder. And so we have to constantly be. Uh, jostling with that yeah uh, that's just an amazing point i think just the fact like we, we get caught up in like oh te- like new technology like Neuralink, a chip in your mind or mm. vr or uh robots and everybody's got 
these smartphones that maybe should concern us the most. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And I mean, another speaking of implants, what hap- what's happening in Sweden right now? Have you seen these like little chips that are in their hands? It's like a small I've, it's like I've a heard rice about grain. this. Yeah. It's like as small as a rice grain. There's like thousands of people who have been doing it, but it's like it's very practical. Now they just tap their thumb to buy stuff. Uh, the keys to their car, everything's electric with electric cars, etc. So everything is in their hand, mm-hmm. um, which makes people wonder, okay, like Mark of the Beast. You know, everyone starts to worry, like, did I accept the Mark of the Beast? Mm-hmm. Right. Which is an interesting conversation because you actually have to declare. Mark of the Beast isn't like, oh, crap, I got a chip in my hand. I didn't realize. Right. Um, Mark of the Beast is something different. Added to the fact that once again, we're down this road further than you would think. Mm-hmm. I mean, we already have our fingerprints that yeah. we're using to open yeah. up our phones yeah. or safes and various other things. Like, So, I mean, I, I, this is one of those things where we have to give it a lot more thought because we tend to encounter something new and be like... And then just... Poof, yeah, yeah. We want to yeah. hit the the explode button. It's like, well, you're actually a lot farther down this than you think. And we mm. need some theological tools, like yeah. we were just talking about, that can help us to navigate it. It's, it's either you navigate it or you go the Amish route and right. you pick a subjective level of technology that's kind of like i will go no further sort of idea yeah and i don't actually i'm not opposed to that i think there are moments where like for example let's talk about the apple vr Mm -hmm. Uh, i'm i have no interest in the apple vr yeah me neither uh and i truthfully i like already told my kids like don't even bother asking for the vr i have i have enough trouble do they want it no, thankfully. Okay. Praise God. But I, but if I were to make it available to them, I'm sure that they would want it. That's, of course. Right? But I'm like, I have trouble enough parenting you on your screen time usage. I don't want to have to deal now with a VR+. Plus. There's a challenge that I think that we face uh, with these new technologies that I really don't like with regards to like the VR, for example, mm-hmm. where you're obscuring half of a person's face. Mm. And having just mm. gone through a pandemic with the other half yeah. of a person's face <laughs> being obscured, I don't want to live in a world that I can't see your face. Yeah. I don't know how you guys feel about that. But yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. And imagine a pandemic with VR. Whole, <laughs> fa- whole face is gone, man. Yeah. Ser- seriously. Yeah. Now you're, now you're living a, in a faceless world. Reminds me of the book title of C.S. Lewis, Tell We Have Faces. Mm. That's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. But faces are important. Yeah. Like yeah. we want to be able to see each other. Because I don't know about you guys, but there's so much relationship that actually takes place by seeing another person yeah and their their facial expressions and yeah. mm-hmm. so if i'm taking that theology back through that matrix of relationship my concern with some of this vr stuff and i'm not like anti vr okay yeah yeah but some of my concern is is this going to help my relationship with say my kids or is this going to hinder it yeah and it just seems like just seeing how uh, much of an addiction screens are and all that kind of stuff and just escaping reality to just go to this place like I just feel like it's really dangerous. Well, this is one of the challenges with AI. So maybe we should jump into some of the yeah, AI it. benefits and challenges. Let's do it. So first off, it's just important for people to appreciate that AI isn't some mystery thing that's yeah. going on. Uh, AI is what we would broadly refer to as machine learning. And one of the maybe helpful ways to kind of wrap your mind around what machine learning is, is right now I have a 16-year-old and I'm teaching him how to drive, Okay. There are three three kinds of knowledge that happens there. Are you teaching any kids to drive? No, yet? but I just like I get nervous already thinking <laughs> yeah. about it. My my boy's five, and I'm like, oh, I got like eleven years, and then I gotta. I'm right. a nervous passenger. Yeah. So I feel like in that situation, it's gonna be pretty <laughs> and, brutal. And I'm scared for my car. Yeah. Too. <laughs> oh yeah. Like, we'll have to get a rental or something. There's right? no way he's touching my car. <laughs> so when you have a car, notice that there's three kinds of knowledge at play. One kind of knowledge is you ride in a car and you can experience it as a backseat driver. Yeah. And I mean, how many backseat drivers think that they know how to drive a car just because they've experienced it? Yeah. And you'd be like, well, no, you, you definitely don't know how to drive a car yeah. just because you've experienced it. Second kind of knowledge is more of like a factual knowledge mm-hmm. where you have to, like my son had to take a written test. Yeah, the learner's test or whatever it is, yeah. Yeah, and be yeah. able to demonstrate that he understands the rules of the road and and how a car works. But again, we wouldn't say, oh, by passing that test, you know how to drive a car. That's because there's this third kind of knowledge that we would refer to as a, a tacit or silent kind of knowledge that's a doing knowledge. The only way to uh, acquire it is by doing. You have to get behind the wheel hmm. and you have to drive. The same thing happened when we learned how to walk or yeah. ride a bike. You have to do it. Machines are no different. You cannot code 
step by step into a machine how to drive a car. It's just yeah. it's just not practical nor do I think it's even possible. Yeah. What you can do though is we we created algorithms back in the 70s and 80s. This might surprise you. Uh, our AI algorithms are not new. They're actually pretty old. Hmm. We just didn't have the the data to process them, nor the processing power. <laughs> yeah, interesting. But, Fascinating. But now the data and the processing power have come together hmm. so that the machine using these algorithms is able to learn to drive a car or to fly a plane or to, uh, here's and here's one of the challenges, of course, is the these algorithms can also be used to learn what you like to watch on YouTube yeah. or what kind of videos that you find are funny. And, and the, the re, all the recommended videos is basically AI, just learning what we like and then feeding right. it to us. That's right, because yeah. you're giving it the data. Yeah, it's able to process that and statistically figure out. You no, know, this is what Andrew would probably yeah. like to watch. And next thing you know, you've wasted two hours of your yeah. life. You know, yeah, giggling yeah. at videos or whatever it might be. So on the one hand, it it's really good at certain things. It can learn how to do certain things. Mm -hmm. There's nothing magical happening. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand. It can, if you're not careful, well, it can become addictive. Yeah. Because it knows me so well and what I like, it it's actually difficult for me to pull myself away from it. Mm. So it all comes back to not necessarily what it what it is, but yeah. how you're using it. Yeah. So that I wouldn't say, oh, AI is evil. I'm yeah. like, I'm thankful for AI. I'm thankful that I get, you know, that we got drones that are really amazing at flying. Mm -hmm. They're using AI algorithms. Right. But at the same time, I need to be cautious realizing that those same algorithms that keep planes in the air yeah. uh, can keep me online and keep me from, say, hanging out with my kids or yeah. talking to my wife or, you know, being a part of my church community. That they, they again, these these in there in that they can be addictive. I got to be cautious because they can pull me away from community. And in and in many ways, I think you guys would agree or tell me what you think that we live in a time where technology is more and more being used to create counterfeit community. Yes. Hmm. And I wonder if it also, we see AI robbing us of community in the sense of like, you know, there's an Amazon building that was just built um, across the bridge and it's a huge brand new building. And someone was telling me that there's no staff inside. It's all run by AI. And then the, the building that's by my house all the people who are working there are pretty nervous because they're just thinking, oh, eventually this whole building's going to just be running its own there. Everyone's going to lose their jobs. Or you look at the McDonald's, that's the first fast food restaurant where there's no staff anymore. Everything is run by AI. So we're also robbing, you know, we think of a workplace where we're all together and you build community at a, you know, that's all falling apart. Well, for me, I don't get quite as concerned about that one because every time we've had technology that's come up, it has created other jobs. For example, uh, when when uh, forklifts were invented, right, or these other hydraulically driven machines that could dig better than a human, lift more weight than a human. Yeah, right. You okay, know, people could that. get nervous, going, "Oh man, I just I'm lost lose my job." Yeah. yeah, it looks like my wheelbarrow job just got you know lost, or yeah. my shoveling job. Well, it's like, well, actually, no. It's just now we can shovel a lot more, and we can do these other things actually more efficiently. And in some ways we're actually being more respectful of human dignity Interesting. by creating ways for people to work that aren't so hard on the human body. Mm. So it's creating other kind of jobs. So I, I kind of tend to be a little more positive in that light. Okay. My, I guess my concern becomes... It's a good perspective. Yeah, I guess yeah. my concern becomes the artificial communities that we can buy into on social media. Yeah, of course. Right, and how yeah. that can be very divisive. Or that I can get so caught up in AI that I can start to give up on real relationships. So let me give you a, a real world example of what's happening right now. Uh, one of the things that AI is able to do, remember AI works by being a, by processing power and processing data to get the statistical results that you're desiring, right? Mm -hmm. And so right now, one of the things that's being done is social you know, influencers, their profiles are being purchased because that's data that can then be put through algorithms and you can spit out or create, I should say, a virtual person. These are often referred to as digital girlfriends. 
and one that is out right now is called Karen AI that Snapchat's been working on where you can purchase a digital girlfriend named Karen. Oh, no, you can't. And then you can text and Karen of all names. Hey? <laughs> really? I know. That's, I know. That, that is that a little, seems a little <laughs> shocking to me because I feel like, you know, no one wants to date a Karen. <laughs> it is no, spelled with kidding. a C. It <laughs> is Shout out if the... you're Karen. Oh, C. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's, that's different. I, I was surprised. That, that, that's, her, <laughs> that's her actual name. Okay. Oh, is it because of like care? Like Karen? I think it's just, no, I think it's just her just, name. Oh, I okay. could be wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you can purchase a digital girlfriend. Right. And Snapchat's putting tons of money into this wow. technology so that it's not just like a text, you know, a texting relationship, but that this could be, you know, more of like if you've seen the movie Her, where you could talk to this person on the phone or you could see like right. a, an image of, of Karen, you know, that you're, you've got this like digital girlfriend. So this is what I'm talking about where I'm saying this artificial Mm -hmm. community, that, that kind of, that kind of tech makes me a whole lot more nervous than, am I going to lose my job? Hmm. What do you guys think? Yeah. I didn't even know Karen existed. It gets awkward when you have more than one person. You're like, Hey, that's my girlfriend. What are you doing? (laughs) It's like, no, she's mine. No, she's mine. It's like 20,000 people dating Karen. How do well, you know? it just strips away the humanity of, and, and like, because it is artificial, like, the, like nothing ultimately replaces a real yeah. human connection. It's similar to like how you said that like you, you can only see half a face, like so much just in like the micro expressions mm-hmm. when you're face to face with somebody. Yeah. Um, it's just, is it, is, do you think it's going to be popular? It already is. What? Now, here's another one. I guess I'm too old for TikTok. (laughs) (laughs) We'll be right back after these messages from dentures. No. Um, Let me tell you another one that's disturbing. Oh, gosh. That I think gets us thinking again. This one was created in South Korea. They created a VR experience for a mother whose uh, daughter died at the age of three. And they recreated virtually her daughter uh, so that she could put on VR glasses and experience uh, her daughter. And so it raises profound questions. Is that wow. actually, and so you can watch that, by the way, it's very disturbing. And and her daughter would have been 11 because, you know, it had been some time since her daughter died. So she's she's literally stuck in a moment with her daughter. Hmm. What, like, what are your thoughts there? Sheesh. That's very interesting to me. I mean, I, I think back to, uh, I think it was one of the Marvel movies where uh, Tony Stark comes out with this technology that's very similar sounding where it recreates like a moment. Um, I think the purpose was to uh, heal a traumatic event where it recreates that event and allows you to be able to play it the way that you would want to, to get over that. See, that's the interesting part though, is that they're, 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 kind of spinning this is, oh, you could heal. Right. But I I can't help but think that, do you actually heal or are you just continually harmful? Yeah. yeah, Is, are you just picking at a scab that you just never let heal? You can never move forward in your life. You're stuck in that, in that moment. And like having experienced grief, like I, and knowing so many people that have also experienced grief, I've, it's so easy to get stuck mm-hmm. in grief mm-hmm. where you are just, you, you don't heal and, and you, you, you get stuck in it. And to have that technology could very well, um, perpetuate that. It, it, like, hmm. could you see it even from your own experience? Could you see something like that being addictive? I think very much even just like to, even if it was taking a video or something and making that into a VR thing where you feel like you're with that person, uh, I, I feel like that would just be disrespectful to the people that you'd have lost to, to digitally create them. Cause I mean, that's the same yeah. thing with, with movies um, using AI and like deep fakes to, to resurrect Hmm. actors from the grave i I think typically they they have to get their estate's permission but it still like raises a lot of questions where people are like is is this okay is this right Mm -hmm. to be bringing back someone in any capacity like that and and notice that it's not about the person Hmm. 
that that you've loved or lost, but it's actually about you. Yeah. Right. So you're not actually asking that question about them. Like, is this respectful to them? Because what be, what you get, and I think this is the real danger in a world of ours where there's this hyper individualism mm. that you've just technology becomes uh, a tool for you to turn inward on yourself. Mm -hmm. And now life and everything's just about me. Mm. Yeah. And ultimately what I think this creates, and this is my this is my concern with technology. Don't get me wrong, I love technology, yeah. but if I were to have a concern with it, would be loneliness. Is that mm. we create a world of of brokenness, of broken relationship, of separation. And it's funny because technology and all the advancements of AI is almost like in a sense, oh, we're trying to bring the world together and almost create a fake sense of oh the opposite of loneliness we're going to it's actually going to bring us closer right. but it's actually but ironically it's doing the opposite doing the opposite and yeah. and if you look at the stats loneliness is an epidemic Jeez. that has swept the world and there was a there was a stat that was just recently that recently was published and maybe I shared this actually last time I was on the show but there was a stat that that showed that loneliness was uh was a global phenomenon this isn't mm. just something happening in the west mm. or or whatnot, and the issues that we're dealing with te with technology are happening globally. Yeah, and interestingly enough, I'm actually heading off to Malawi in May. We're filming a new project on the issue of theology and technology. Oh, okay. interesting, cool. Yeah, and all of our conversations with people in in Africa are saying, "Man, the stuff that you guys are dealing with in you know here in Canada, it's what we're dealing with in Malawi." Wow. Hmm. wow. This is great that we talk about it because no matter who's watching and where they're watching, this relates. And it's important for us to dive in. So as AI continues to develop and all these things are changing, technology is changing, how can we as Christians and how can the church engage with the development and integration of AI in a way that, you know, we still stay true to mm -hmm. biblical values? Well, I think one of the things that's going to need to happen is, first, of course, I, I would say not that we're afraid of technology, but that we seek to understand yeah. technology. Yeah. And that in seeking to understand technology that we seek to understand theology and that we understand those things correctly because if we don't understand our theology how do we expect to navigate technology hmm. <laughs> and, and a prime example Good. of this would be what you brought up earlier that the lame will walk you know the the, the blind will see and yeah and that you'll be raised to new life in the cloud the question that needs to be asked is well is is that what we want? Hmm. Is that a biblical perspective of what heaven is? Mm -hmm. Is this, you know... Or to never die. Yeah, to never die. Yeah. Because this might shock some Christians. I hope it doesn't, but this might shock some Christians that heaven and the Christian perspective is not about living forever. Eternal life, the way Jesus defines it, is relational life. Hmm. He says in John chapter 17, this is eternal life, that they might know you. It's community. You and I were created for eternal community, not for eternal life. Mm. And in fact, I would say that if we're not careful, our technology, we're going to use it to create uh, a world that isn't a heaven, but the complete opposite. Mm. It's a world of broken relationships that are perpetuated. They don't, they don't end. We call that something different. We call that hell. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's a really good way of... Like, I mean, I'm, I'm not shocked at the reality, but a lot of Christians maybe don't have that perspective. Mm -hmm. They just think of it, that, that's really good. That's a good word. So one other thought on this uh, would be that we need to have a correct perspective of what it means to be human mm -hmm. and, that, and, ho and how we arrive at that conclusion because it helps us have a correct perspective of AI. So again... So let's walk through it. Tell yeah. us, what is a correct perspective of being human? Yeah, so I would say a correct perspective of being human is first to understand that, again, from a biblical perspective, that a thing is not defined by its parts, but by its purpose. Mm. So we're, we make a distinction then between the parts that a thing is made of and the purposeful whole that a thing is made for. Mm. Uh, science, by the way, I love science, and science is really awesome at analyzing what a thing is made of and the laws those parts follow. And then we can use that scientific knowledge to engineer uh, different objects, such as a spaceship, that can achieve various purposes. Mm -hmm. So in the sciences, by the way, we use this kind of language. We'll talk about pure science, which is about analyzing and studying the parts of things made of, the laws they follow, versus applied science 
is those people in engineering, for example, that are using that knowledge to achieve purposes. Right. From the Christian perspective, then, we're saying we have been engineered. We are not an accident. We were created by God. We did not engineer ourselves, but we have been engineered by God for a purpose. Mm. And that's a key idea then, because if I want to know what it means to be human, I have to understand what the purpose of human life is. Mm -hmm. And then answering that also answers what leads to my flourishing. Mm. Because of course, a thing flourishes when it achieves its purpose. So going back to what Jesus said then, Jesus said that the purpose of human life is relationship. Love God, love people. It's about community. It's the way actually, you know, when we look at the Bible, the Bible begins the same way it ends. Mm. Starts with community. That community was broken through sin and evil. Through Jesus, that community has been restored, that we can be, that we can fulfill the purpose that we were created for. And just let me just highlight that by the way. There's a great verse, uh, Colossians 1:28. Well, Paul highlights this where he says that. He's striving with all of his strength, he says, so that he can make everyone perfect in Christ. Mm -hmm. And the Greek word for perfect is teleos, which derives from the Greek telos, which is where we get the word purpose from. So purpose is telos, Mm. and a thing is purpose, perfect, teleos, when it can achieve its purpose. And so other words, in other words, Paul's saying, that you and I are made perfect. Mm. We flourish mm. when we achieve the purpose that we were created for, and we can only do that through Jesus. Mm. And then if I take that my, that paradigm, right, and then I, I, can, I can look at other things. I can look at this chair and understand what its purpose is, and that, that's how I define it. Because we always define a thing by its purpose, mm. uh, a created thing. And then I can ask the same thing of AI. Like mm. if it's a machine that's been designed to be like a human being, well, all you have is a human imitation machine. Yeah. Does Man. that make does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. And just having that like lens. So then once you understand that, you can look at anything that's happening in the world and be able to yep. navigate because things keep changing. But if you keep that truth and that lens. It helps you also to appreciate the distinction between science and, and the Christian faith. Yeah. And that the two actually go together. Yeah, a lot of people say yeah. their science is here and faith is here, but that's not the case. That's not the case. God yeah. created yeah. the universe. He created the parts and the laws those yeah. parts follow. Yeah. So in essence, I part of worship, man, is just to get to know what God's created and be mm-hmm. able to marvel at the complexity of the universe that he created. But I want to know, of course, more than the parts I want to know the purpose. It's kind of like any story. Anybody who's reading a story, they want to know the plot. They want to mm-hmm. know the purpose. They want to know why were the 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 parts created, if you will. Yeah. And that's what the Bible's getting after. The Bible is not a science textbook. Yeah. Uh, the Bible is a purpose book. It's a yeah. book telling you about why God created, and the you know the bigger uh, narrative arc that you and I find ourselves in. Yeah, it's good. It's really good, man. Um, okay, so. Can AI technologies be then? I guess it could be utilized in great ways to service and promote justice, mercy, compassion. You know, as emphasized in what we read in the Word. Yeah, it could be used for good. That's just it. So if yeah. I have a good, if I have an understanding then of what leads to my yeah. my flourishing, yeah. and that community and relationships important. Well, I could use technology in great ways. So, for yeah. example, the telephone yeah. is awesome. I call my mom all the time, who yeah. lives in in Oregon. Yeah. And technology brings me closer to my mom. Yeah. I can't always drive there to be with her, or I yeah. can FaceTime with a friend. Yeah. I think that brings us closer yeah. to each other. Yeah. You know, now of course you could use it in a way that starts to drive you apart from somebody, or maybe you're having a conversation with somebody over text that really should be in person mm-hmm. because you'll say something on text you would never say to yeah. their face, sort of idea. Yeah. So you and I have to constantly navigate that that my technology is yeah. leading to good. Yeah. Right, and it and it can lead to to um, broken relationship. It can lead to evil. This is one of the reasons why we're doing that filming project in Malawi. We're filming this this guy named Moses that came out of the Congo, uh, and won a number. It's a very amazing story. Won a number of scholarships. Went all the way to getting an advanced degree in AI. But he, it's a story of a guy who just constantly uses technology to love God and to love wow. people. Wow. And one of the ways he does it that's a really interesting part of the story is with uh, drip line systems and different things to help people feed themselves through the dry season in Africa, particularly in Malawi. And I'm like, what a great example of how you know tech can do some amazing things. That's very cool. That's very cool. And so going back then to Neuralink, there's a lot of 
amazing benefits and a blessing. So if someone's able to walk again or see again for the purpose of loving God and loving others, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And it's and it's actually a very tangible way that we can love somebody else by helping them yeah. uh, walk again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th- like think about it even in this regard. I mean, uh, our medicines are seeking human health, right? Mm. But the question that we have to ask theologically is, well, what is a healthy human in the face of technology? Mm-hmm. What leads to our good? And that's where we have to constantly come back to that lens of relationship, I think. Yeah, and create the proper boundaries. Like my next question was, what biblical principles should guide Christians in discerning the appropriate boundaries and limitations of AI? So let me throw that one back to you and say, if you got you know somebody coming up to you wanting to get a digital girlfriend or... Gosh. <laughs> I want to date what Karen. Would you, what would you? Yeah, yeah. I want to date Karen. I'm thinking about asking Karen out. I'm thinking, uh, please tell me Karen with a K. <laughs> That's my first question. <laughs> and if he says no, Karen with a C, I'll be like, okay, um, man. Like, just I don't know how to graciously, lovingly do it, but you'd need to steer them to relationship, person face to face, and get away from. Because that's dangerous and that's not good. And that will lead to loneliness and depression and all kinds of stuff, I'm sure. And so, I mean, you'd have to biblically counsel them and guide them away from that into person, just fellowship, community, get into a local church. There's Karens with Ks there who are amazing. (laughs) I mean, there's so many people who complain. There's so many girls and guys who complain, I can't find a girl, I can't find a guy. Well, going to TikTok and dating Karen is not going to be the answer. There are... Let me throw another one at you, though, Okay. because some people might not be able to relate with a digital girlfriend, but what if your kid comes to the dinner table with their phone and starts texting during dinner time? Yeah, that seems like that's going to happen quite soon. <laughs> and I was actually going to bring that up to you because you were saying, you know, texting someone instead of having a personal conversation. Well, well, what about someone who's texting when they're actually having a personal conversation and now they're, and I am so guilty of that so many times, mm. if it's my wife or my kids or someone's talking to me. And I'm just kind of responding to something quickly and I'm totally separate. I do that all the time and I feel ter- terrible about it. Because I, I don't know about you, but I do love the new feature on some phones where you can have the do not disturb. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. awesome. Right? So but you know what I me, think? Leave me alone. I'm talking with a real human being here. I know, but I also feel like sometimes I don't want to put that on. And I'm just confessing because it's like I want to... You, I want to be disturbed. I kind of want to be... Dis- that's disturbing. <laughs> actually but it's like i want to be interrupted or i want to n- not um remove myself from that outside noise why do you think that is that's an interesting question uh, i don't i don't know because obviously my kids my wife they're in front of me like they, oh it's kind of like a fomo maybe like uh, what am i going to miss out if i put this yeah do not maybe disturb on? You know, I used to always have like the fear of like, and this is just, I'm being completely honest right now. I appreciate like, the honesty. Yeah, not like turning my do, do not disturb or turning it on to silent in case like, you know, my parents call me if something happened in the middle of the night and they needed some help or I always think like worst case scenario, someone's in need of something and so I want to keep it right with me, active. So it's always, you know, and I had to actually like talk to someone about that and try to figure out, it's like, no, they're going to be fine or whatever the mm-hmm. case is or do you have another way that you can get in touch with them? But I think that's a big thing, fear of missing out or fear of not being there for mom or dad if they needed something or I don't know. And the what if conversations in my head always lead me down a terrible path. Yeah. Yeah. I just had to do an MRI the other day and I've never done one. And I'm kind of, they said, are you claustrophobic? I said, okay, like depends. But like going through this tube and you know, whatever. And I just had my eyes closed the whole time. And then I started having what if moments. Because mm-hmm. it's like the noise is going on for so long. And he usually said he'll give me breaks so that I could swallow again because I couldn't swallow. They're doing one on my neck. And um, and so the the sound was going for quite a while. And I'm thinking, what if that guy just passed out? <laughs> he didn't turn off. I'm going to be laying here for like 20 hours. Or what if like an earthquake happened and I'm in the middle of this and they all run and they leave me. It's like you keep thinking of the what if. And so I leave my phone active and not under d- disturb. Do not disturb because of what ifs. Mm-hmm. Slash. Maybe there's an addiction too that I like the. Actually, know. that brings up I I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up or not because I sort of is putting the blame somewhere where it should be, but it's also perhaps not the purpose of this conversation. But um, it's interesting that the same companies that are coming out with these do not disturb or screen time or this 
the mindfulness, be mindful of how much screen time, what companies are they? Hmm. It's the same one, Apple, Google, Facebook. Right. They're mm-hmm. the ones who want you engaged. Like mm-hmm. that. that's their bottom line is they want your eyes on that screen. So then they've come out with these, you know, oh, we're going to make things better and make it look like we are solving your problem or helping you with your screen time. Hmm. When yeah. really they don't actually want that. Well, it is, it is ironic that they created the problem. Yeah. And now they're like, hey, sorry we made this so addictive. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe you... Knowing very full well before they even release things, this is going to be addictive. Yeah. And that's the, that's the goal. Yeah. Yep. I think this is one of the challenges, of course, that we're finding of, uh, you know, the, the free market economy, if you mm-hmm. will. And I'm not saying that because I'm disparaging of democracy or the free market. I, I love both. But if dollar signs rule the day... You know, and if if tech if tech companies are only ruled by dollar signs, well, then humanity they're not looking at your humanity. Of course, they're just they're just looking at how much money can they make. Mm. And we have to be aware of that, realizing that part there's some responsibility. Yeah, there's responsibility to those tech companies, but there's responsibility for me too, and mm-hmm. how I'm using these technologies and whether or not uh, I'm in charge or the technology is yeah. in charge. Okay, I want to circle it back to you though, and say, okay, your 16 year old comes after your driving lessons. And he's like, Dad, I think I'm in love. <laughs> and you're like, what's her name? Karen. What would you do? Well, wh- this is something that I've already been doing. I call this uh, proactive parenting versus reactive parenting. <sighs> this is going to be good. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> Take notes. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Because oftentimes as a parent, you tend to want to be, you tend to want to react. Mm. And then you just kind of sit on the bench and just wait until you're, child comes and then you're like, okay, now, now I'll deal with this. Cause now yeah. my child's acting me, asking me, I would say that that's reactive where we need to be proactive. We need to be talking about what is going on in the culture and helping them navigate it before they're even coming oh, that's to you so good. with yeah. that. Yeah. Because it happens in so many different ways, especially in the culture wars that we're yeah. living through right now. You know, that that doesn't take long for our kids to experience these things. And think we have the responsibility to prepare them for it yeah. instead of just l- letting them uh, get blindsided by it. Yeah. So for example, then in our house, we talk a lot about the importance, for example, of church, mm-hmm. not because thou shalt go to church on Sunday. Mm-hmm. We talk about the idea of what it means to truly flourish. Mm-hmm. And I'll talk about church the same way I'll talk about their friends. Mm-hmm. Like you need to make time for your friends. Yeah. You know, you need to go hang out with your friends. You need to go like get on, you know, yeah. get on the phone and call yeah. up your friend because yeah. you need to hang out. Yeah. But I'm I'm like, church is the same way. Like you need you need to be a part of your brothers and sisters in Christ. You need to be part of the church community mm-hmm. and you need to make time for the Lord. You need to make time for people and and helping them to navigate and go, oh yeah, you know, the the good life is found in community. Mm-hmm. This community I have with my with my family you know, with mom and dad, but community that I have outside of this in the in the world at large and particularly yeah. in the church. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think mm-hmm. like, I, I feel like every, a lot of the conversations we have about a lot of different topics all come back to this idea of the importance of community. And you always feel better afterwards. Oh, for sure. It's like when, when I it, come back from church on a Sunday, I'm like literally buzzing. Mm. But oftentimes before church, you're like, do I go this week? Totally. Yeah. You know, and you drag like, your feet. You drag yeah. your feet. I don't want to go. I'm tired or this or that. And then you go, you come back and I'm just like, it is so good to be with the people of God. Do you know what I think that is, by the way? I think we just take community for granted. Mm. And it's, I don't know if you've ever experienced loneliness. I don't know if you, like, have you ever been like pulled out of community or a good show that I, I love is called Alone, where they just take people and they drop them out in the wilderness. Oh, dude, you told me about that, and I started watching it. That's insane. It's insane. Yeah, and how how fast some people break and how strong some people are. I'd be home the first hour. Yeah, I don't know that you would last very long on that show. I would die, but I would love to watch it. I'm going to tell you right now. Be checking Um, your phone. (laughs) (laughs) All right. But the, the, the reason I bring that up is it doesn't matter how tough you are. Everyone will break eventually. Yeah. And what breaks you isn't the the food. It's the community, yeah. the need for relationship. And it, it's amazing how many of those contestants will have a spiritual experience out there going, I need to take community more seriously. Yeah. But that's part of that sin, brokenness, evil 
problem with us. We have this bent towards turning towards ourselves. And although yeah. we know we need community yeah. and we we truly do want it, yeah. we'll wake up on a Sunday morning and go, do I, uh, do I'm I really? Yeah, I'm tired. Yeah. yeah. And I, I thought, you know, with the pandemic for three years and us being not allowed to go to church and not allowed to see people and all these different things that were happening, we all got a sense of isolation mm -hmm. and being alone. And for people, you know, I had my, my wife and I had my kids. And so like there was still some kind of community around me, but there are a lot of people who aren't in that situation and would have felt a deep, deep sense of loneliness. And I feel like for me, I would have thought that I would have learned more the importance of community going through something so severe like that. Mm. And then you fast forward a few years, I'm tired. I don't want to go to church. Whereas when I'm in the middle of the pandemic, I'm like, man, I took community for granted. I can't wait till we're all together again. And, and even think about the way that you said that, you know, it, even the whole the whole way you're talking there, it's always about ourselves. Yeah. I don't wake up on a Sunday morning and think, oh my goodness, I got some friends at church. They need me to be there. Right? We don't, we tend not to think about other people. Yeah, for sure. Man, <laughs> like, oh man, I got some friends. They need some community. I've got to be there for them. Yeah. It's always about what, well, do I want community? Hmm, do I want community this week or not? Yeah. You know, because yeah. it goes both ways. Yeah. You know, for me to have community means somebody else has to show up. Yeah. Right? Where we both have to value yeah. relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when Brett Landry was here a few weeks ago, we talked about that. It's like, no, you're actually also needed for someone. It's not just go and take something. Yeah. Go to church knowing that actually someone needs you there mm -hmm. too. And uh, we we get to sharpen each other and encourage each other in that. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I realize how I said it. And I feel like that's just how I, that's how we all. Yeah, I wasn't disparaging no, of no, you. No, no, but I just think it's just interesting. Because we're all like that. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I, ch I catch that with myself all the time. Yeah, for sure. Do you remember there was a conversation about the, uh, was it was it the robo pastor? Yeah, we, so that happened. So last year um, in Germany, they had the first service that was done with AI. Yeah, I think and chat the, GPT. Yeah, it was like the pastor. Yeah, put together the, the order service and yeah, stuff. And yeah. then actually performed the service. It was like, uh, it was all run. I don't know how they even did that. There's a, uh, Dr. John Neufeld um, wrote an article on it actually. Hmm. And we'll leave it available at indo.ca under the episode sources. But basically the whole thing was run by, um, by AI. And I thought, okay, well that is interesting because AI is presenting the gospel, but there's also that human, you know, interaction that is very needed. To take it the step further, going into now with the, um, Apple vision pro and VR becoming uh, a bigger thing that I could see it taking that next step where you just have church vr church oh. where you just stay at home and not only is it an ai generated service but you're not even leaving your home and people could argue oh well you can chat with people virtually or whatever but mm. you just have an at-home church experience that feels like you're in community in community well and before you know it yeah your whole existence is can be alone yeah. Right. Now, there's another aspect of this, like on the one, on one layer, as we've been talking thus far, we've been talking about human relationships. But think about this, particularly with regards to the church service from that deeper layer of our relationship with God, and particularly that we were created to be in a very intimate relationship with God in which we are the temple of God. God lives in us, that the Holy Spirit communes with us mm. and works in and through us. So I think this is a part, again, this is where theology steps in and says, technology can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like how is, how is a church that's being run by AI being led by the Holy Spirit? Hmm. <laughs> but would we say we're limiting the Holy Spirit that he can't work through algorithms and AI? Now that's an interesting question, <laughs> but I do think that it's may, it's quite clear that we not only having been made in the image of God, but having been made for a uh, for community with God, mm -hmm. sit in a very different place than animals do, and yeah. and do technology, yeah. even technology that are created to be artificial relationships, mm -hmm. right? And so that becomes a really interesting idolatry, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Where we start to create uh, a relationship with God that yeah. becomes virtual, yeah. 
And it's just really interesting to me that even like it's called artificial. Mm -hmm. That just really stands out to me. Like we're trying to replace something that is not, you know what I mean? Like community and being together and fellowship and going to church and intimacy with God and all these things. That's like just the tangible, real, beautiful, you know, abiding in Christ. Whereas all this other stuff is just, it's not, it's artificial. And think about that from God's perspective. So from our perspective, we might be consuming artificial, but then we could ask from God, does God want to consume a, an artificial relationship with me? Hmm. Like, does God want me to get a prayer app? Not saying, I don't even know if a prayer app exists like this, but where I could be like, oh, I got to pray for my sister and got to pray for my you know, uncle who's got skin cancer or whatever it might be. And I'll just, I'll have the app. You pray know, for me. Pray. Yeah. Pray for me. Yeah. That could be the app. We could start that up. It could be called pray for me. <laughs> pray pray for me. <laughs> I'm saying. Right. And now we got these AI prayers going out. I mean, I could imagine God being pretty angry with something <laughs> yeah. like that. All of Vincent's prayers just coming up. But I mean, so would we though, wouldn't we? I mean, if your son's like, hey dad, uh, by the way, I, you know, I've got AI now that will allow me to communicate, you know, with you. Yeah. And it's no longer them. You'd be like, not, not happening. Not I want you, it. son. I yeah. want you. So yeah. That's what God says to us. Yeah. That's so good, man. Um, I think, I think we went through everything. Yeah. We even created a business. We, for yeah. me. <laughs> we got a bit, we got to just, we'll be right back. We're going to come up with our marketing strategy <laughs> and uh, kind of come up with our business plan. What's our five-year goal? I know, I'm, I'm curious to, to know your take on like video games, if that would be in a similar vein of it's just really, how you use your time because like w when you talk about like you know the ai girlfriend if that same son is like well well but i i play my video games so what's wrong with with that can the same argument really be applied to to both mm. i i i think it i think it can be in various capacities where maybe my video games are become such an addiction to me that i'm giving up on real relationship where I'd prefer to play a video game over uh, being with a friend or you're playing a video game that now is incorporating aspects of life that, that we would say it shouldn't be from having sex on a video game, right. To having a girlfriend within a video game. Right. Right. Cause I, I've just, I've been hearing more and more video games heading in that, hmm. that direction where they're kind of like incorporating video games and pornography into, into one sort of thing. So, I, cause I'm not of the opinion that video games are evil. Right. Yeah. Right. Cause I, I, and I think actually video games in some ways can be very community building, but the problem is Mario we, Kart. Are you kidding me? Right. <laughs> Mario right? Kart parties, hundred percent community. Especially building. when I'm winning. Oh yeah. <laughs> but at the same, it's kind of like a board game, right? Yeah, a board yeah. game can do the same thing, but it could also, be what can also be used for good can also be used for evil. And I'm seeing that with everything, all that we're talking everything. about. There's a really good and there's, it could really, like I think your analogy of even the phone, it's like there's things with my phone that can bring me closer to God and make me more aware of his presence and there's things that will distract me from him and my family. Yep. So we just have so, to be really careful. So like with then an AI girlfriend, is there any way that that could be good? Is there any scenario? That's a, you know what? I think that those are the kind of questions we should be asking ourselves. You know, can, can anything in this be redeemed? Because I mean, if you're like, you come away from this and you're like, no, nothing in this can be redeemed. Uh, I, I think that you, you've helped yourself learn how to navigate, uh, you know, yeah. technology in that moment. So with regards to uh, a digital girlfriend, I, I do not see, at, as I just think about it here, I can't think of anything re redemptive uh, in that. Yeah. I can't either. I can't. Chris, if you're listening, I love you. But <laughs> Michelle, Michelle, we should just say hi Nancy. to our wives. Yeah. <laughs> it Michelle. is. Here, here's the argument I can see people making. And I, I just want to show how this brings us back to the church mm -hmm. is that people could say, Oh, but Andy, there's so many, you know, lonely people in the world. Wouldn't you rather that they had community than, than sit at home alone that they could have, you know, sweet, sweet Karen, you know, to, to talk sweet to Karen with a C. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, at some point you're going to be like, no, actually, uh, I think that that is not what they need. They're, they're giving up real community for artificial community. Mm -hmm. And then I think you got to say that people need real community. And then I could hear them asking, well, where do they get that? 
Hmm. Where do we get real community? And I think the answer is the church. Yeah. Yeah. And then being in church community and having brothers and sisters around you, they're going to keep you accountable when you feel tempted to woo Karen. And you might find a real Karen there. You might find a real Karen with a C or K. I don't know. (laughs) Both could be saved. This whole thing, it's very like real life matrix is what it feels like we're... Yes, with a spin though, wouldn't you say? Because in the Matrix, the movie, the machines put people into the... Uh, matrix. Right. But we're finding the real world is that people want to put themselves in the matrix. Yeah. Well, and even hmm. in that movie, the the guy he chooses, he wants to just stay living in the counterfeit reality. And yeah. In, in, yeah, in the end, first it's machines put him in there. Yeah. And in the end, he wants to put himself back in there. Yeah. And I, I honestly, I've given that one a lot of thought because I was like the matrix I thought was so on point. And I'm like, well, uh, reality showing us that they didn't quite have that one figured out, <laughs> you know, in the movie that people are quite happy enough to put themselves into the matrix. And I think as Christians, you know, this is a, this is something that we have to think a lot about, like what, what is real living? And, you know, cause real relationships are hard. They're mm-hmm. full of challenges and frustrations, but we have to think more deeply about that in that maybe those challenges of real relationships are actually good for me. Mm. And I need to embrace yeah. the, the, that journey for, for what it is that, that even though it's hard, it's good. Yeah, it's a good word. It's an awesome conversation. And I think it's a conversation we need to keep having because things keep changing mm-hmm. and evolving quickly. I mean, we just need to be on top of it and how we can navigate the different things. But it seems like, you know, as technology keeps changing, um, you know, our philosophy and our theology doesn't. Yeah. And so having, like you said, having a firm understanding of theology will help us understand and navigate technology. Yeah. And so being in the word, being in fellowship, being in community, having accountability, uh, an abiding relationship with Christ, those are the things we need to focus on. And then when we have a general understanding of the word and what the word says and how we ought to live it out, we'll be able to navigate all the uncertainties and all the changes. Um, and so just a fascinating conversation. Thank you for being here with us today, Andy. And we look forward to yeah, conference happening you. March 1st and 2nd. So yeah. go to apologeticscanada.com. Yeah. Get yeah. your tickets. We're going to be there. We're doing the in Show Live there, which I'm so pumped about. Yeah, I can't believe we d- almost didn't even mention That's this. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Like, I I am so excited about this. Man, I'm so pumped. We got Andrew. We got Dr. John yep. going to be there. And I've asked them. Hey, you know, in the Bible, I love the Bible, man. But there are some sections you come to in the Bible where you're like, I don't understand why that's yeah. in the Bible. Yeah. Well, we've we've thrown those off to Andrew, and he's going to ask those hard questions yeah. to Dr. John. And I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be really resourceful. And he's going to give us yeah. good tools and tips of how to navigate the passages that are just hard to understand or just straight up weird. Yep. Or the footnotes are not enough. We just still don't understand. So he's going to give us clarity on some of the crazy ones yeah. and also teach us when we're in the Word, how do we have the proper tools to, to so, navigate the Word. So the In Doubt Podcast live Come at on, the Apologetics man. Canada Conference. It's Let's gonna go. It's going to be amazing. I'm yeah. actually, we're so excited. So March 1st and 2nd, get your tickets. We'll see you there. It's going to be such a great time. It's Saturday morning where we're doing the, where we're doing the In Doubt Show live, so it's going to be awesome. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for all you're doing yeah. for ministry. We're such, such huge fans of Apologetics Canada yeah, thank here you. at In Doubt, and so we're grateful. Sorry sorry again about the robot. Tell your son. Uh, you know what? I said sorry. I know. You, you might have to get him a new one, but not Karen. All right. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> have a great week. Bye.